Well, I mean, the NATO summit, everything, everything that's happening right now on the ground in Ukraine uh, relates to um, shaping perceptions, uh, shaping the agenda of the of the NATO summit. Um, and I think we can see the first indication that um, NATO is in a state of disarray is that they were unable to find a new NATO uh, secretary general to replace Stoltenberg. So he's been extended for a year. Um, apparently, the British wanted Ben Wallace and the Americans wanted uh, Ursula. Um, and um, they couldn't come to an agreement. So and because NATO is a consensus driven organization, they went to the default. And you have to ask yourself, why couldn't they come to an agreement? I thought NATO was you know, has never been more unified than it is today. But the fact is NATO is a dysfunctional organization that has um, invested heavily uh, in the uh, war in Ukraine and the war is going badly, very badly for, for NATO. And, uh, and I, I think you're going to be seeing a NATO summit that was supposed to be um, sort of a, a victory uh, celebration of the great counteroffensive, putting Russia back on its heels, using uh using this to create momentum to achieve a strategic defeat of Russia. And instead, uh, NATO is going to be gathering together, confused about its future, scared about its future, uncertain about its future. And um, there's no person better to lead a scared, uncertain, uh, nervous uh, alliance than Jan Stoltenberg, because he personifies scared, nervous, uncertain. You know, I discovered when I went into law enforcement, after a couple of years in law enforcement, I discovered something very important. I didn't even realize this. The people that try to act the toughest are the weakest. You know, the people that try to act a bit of this, they're the, they're the weakest people. And the people, the really, really tough people, just kind of quiet. Just they don't bother anybody, but you don't want to screw with them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I and I found that the mouthiest ones and Stoltenberg is one of the mouthiest ones. Uh, you know, he, oh, yeah. they're all he's all in, oh, and, and I guess that's why they wanted von der Leyen, because these are people that I don't care what's happening. Everything could be crashing around them. They're going to stick to the narrative. And it seems to me that the Biden people, the neocons, are, they're not about sometimes it doesn't even seem like they care what's happening on the battlefield. All they're trying to do is maintain a narrative. Yeah, I, I mean, let's look at Ursula. Um, when she was the defense minister of Germany, she destroyed the German military. Uh, there's a reason why Germany can't put multiple brigades in the field today, and that's because Ursula. Um, there's a reason why they can't produce new equipment. It's because of Ursula. Um, she really is horrible. Uh, the only thing she's good at is parroting American policy positions. She's extraordinarily adept at um, being the loyal servant. And that's what she is, a loyal servant of America. Um, and that's why we want her. We want somebody who will say, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. Um, ben Wallace, um, I know why the British want Look, the British have been very aggressive in terms of their support for Ukraine. And Ben Wallace uh, personifies this aggression. Uh, the problem is um, Britain's got nothing. They got no game. Um, you know, this is, this is, you know, would be the equivalent of, of uh, me um, trying to join the NBA. And uh, he said, well, Scott, you know, it's old man appreciation. So, uh yeah, come on in, dress up, sit at the end of the bench, and maybe second half, if we're up 400 points, we might put you in. And for me to get in there in the first quarter going, hey, block them out. What's your problem? Oh, get a pick, get a pick, get a pick. Hustle, hustle, hustle. And they're going to be looking at you going, dude, you really don't get to do this because you're not really a factor in this. And Ben Wallace is the equivalent of that, the, the old white dude. Uh, you know, who's been allowed to dress up and uh, sitting at the end of the bench uh, trying to pretend he's a player. Um, England has no military. <laughs> Let's just be straight up on that. And NATO is a military alliance. So, you know, would we, why, why would we, why, why would anybody want to have Ben Wallace, who is just a mouthpiece of, uh, of an empty, you know, literally he's the mouthpiece of an empty suit because that's all the British military today is, is an empty suit. Um, not a good look. So um, I think the United States would prefer to have somebody who's totally subservient to America without confusing the picture by uh, making people believe that this is somehow the resurrection of, uh, 
of Great Britain, the global power. Uh, Great Britain's a joke militarily. Uh, literally, they've they've got nothing. I've, I've said it before. I'll say it again. You can put the entire British army into any major, any major soccer stadium in Europe today, and you'll have 30,000 unsold seats. You know, Scott, uh, uh, something I said recently, I, you know, a couple weeks back, I looked at it, and you probably heard me say it. If you play chess and you're looking at the board and everybody looks at it and you say, in three moves, this checkmate, there's no way around it. You just wipe the board clean and start. You know, when it gets to the point that the end is certain, the game is over. All right. Like, yeah, I played. I'm not very good, but I played before. And more often than not, I'm the one looking at checkmate. Uh oh, I'm in trouble <laughs> in three moves. Yeah, Garland, let's start again. You've just lost 10 in a row. Let's go for 11. Right. When I look at the battlefield and I see you know, dragon's teeth, mines, you name it. I see Russia in the areas that they've they've taken. I see these, you know, impenetrable, um, uh, 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 um, you know, elements of, 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 of protection. When I look at what's happening with Ukraine, they're still begging for equipment. They're throwing a few guys in it. They get blown up. When I see the condition of Ukraine, it, I, I look at it and I say, well, well, it's over. Russia has taken a lot of stuff. They're sitting there. You, Ukraine can't possibly penetrate their defenses. And they're just sitting there picking off stuff, blowing, bombing, artillery. It's over. You're just They're just sitting there. And now Ukraine's like, yeah, we got to do another. Uh, we got to go get more people. But the ones that you have are dead and they're not well trained. And now it's like, oh, we'll send to F-16s. Is it over? It seems like it's over to me. What is? Where did they go from here? Going into NATO, also add this, with the discussion coming into NATO, with anybody with half a brain looking at this, I'm not a, you're a military guy. You can tell me, I'm looking at the battlefield situation saying this damn fight is over. At any rate, go ahead. Yeah, if we're playing chess, it's over. Three moves, it's done. You're you're 100% correct. Um, my concern is that NATO may say, well, we ain't playing chess anymore. You know? And, um, and 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 seek to to do because they are desperate. Let's let's be clear what's at stake here: the survival of NATO, the viability of NATO. NATO is a viable institution going forward. Um, let's also remember what's happening this week um, in France. There are serious, um, you know, there's serious unrest. And France, of course, is um, you know the storming of the Bastille and. Uh, in July, what was it, 1789, um, was the supposed to be the birthplace of modern democracy. I mean, there it is, you know, the people, uh, liberty, equality, and all this good stuff. Uh, France, a member of NATO that espouses civilian control of the military, um, they would never tolerate the notion of, a, you know, supporting a coup d'etat in a democratic society. Right now, there's talk of a coup d'etat in France. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen, but things have gotten so bad that people are saying maybe it's time for the military to step in. Um, Europe's busted. Europe's broke. Um, hopefully, they can fix it. I'm not betting against France. I'm betting for France. I'm, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been to, I've, I've, I've been to Paris. Um, I've been to France. I've traveled extensively. I've worked with them. I respect them. Um, I want nothing but good things to happen to to France. But uh, what I want and what what's happened are two totally different things. And bad things are happening to France. And um, you know, bad things are happening to Europe. Uh, Germany is in the process of deindustrialization. That's not me saying. It's a major German think tank saying, "Gosh, things have gotten so bad. We are actually uh, deindustrializing." Germany, which was the industrial heartland of, uh, of, of Europe, is deindustrializing. Um, it, it, basically, Europe is falling apart. And, you know, Europe <laughs> is the foundation of NATO. Uh, that is what makes NATO NATO. And so you, you, we, we have to be realistic about, um, you know, what NATO expects. You know, these nations have spent the last you know, 70, 80 years married to a, an idea, an ideal that's no longer viable. And how do you walk away from that? Especially when nobody has identified an alternative. Europe's scared right now, frightened. They don't know what their future is. And all they know is NATO. 
And so this NATO summit is going to be a gathering of frightened nations, desperate for some miracle outcome that, um, that changes what appears to be their destiny, which is they put all their, they bet everything on the Ukrainian horse and the, coming down on the last uh, furlongs and the Ukrainian horse is lying down on the field with three broken legs. It ain't going to win. Um, so, you know, we, we heard, we talked, I think we talked about this. Uh, I know I've talked about it. I thought maybe we, we mentioned it. Rasmussen, the former um, secretary general of NATO talking about creating a, um, a coalition of the willing that functions outside of the NATO framework but consists of nato nations and you see what's happening you see poland lithuania latvia estonia coming together um, and talking about creating a force of intervention uh, you see poland now uh, having meetings with Zelensky about creating some sort of union um, that would create the political uh, vehicle for a force of intervention to come in um, it ain't chess anymore uh, it's something different um, and will NATO go along with this? You know, the polls right now are talking about they want nuclear weapons. They want the U.S. to put uh, the B-61 bombs uh, on Polish soil. And um, everybody's saying that that's insane, and, and it is insane. But, you know, a lot of people aren't picking up on something that happened in April of last year. Uh, Jessica Cox, who is the director of the, uh, of the NATO nuclear directorate, nuclear planning directorate, uh, came out and said, "Yeah, we've come together and we've decided that um, you know the F thirty five A is the is the beast. That's the that's what we're getting. Uh, we have a thirty five aircraft package that we're uh, encouraging people to, to buy. You see, the Germans bought their thirty five. The Poles are buying their thirty five. The 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 the, the Finns are buying their thirty five. Um, and, and what this is is it's a it's a nuclear strike package, and." Um, these are F-35A, they're nuclear capable planes. Uh, the Germans will transition from the tornado to the uh, to the F-35. Um, you see other nations doing that as well. The Dutch are gonna do that. The Belgians are gonna do that. The Italians are gonna do that. The Turks won't be allowed to do that because even though they were part of the F-35 joint development program, that's been terminated because they bought the S-400. So let's leave the Turks out of this for a second. But Poland has it. And in April of 2022, Cox said, what we need to do is look at how we integrate the uh, F-35 capabilities of our non-nuclear partners, integrate them into the nuclear uh, package, which means that while the nuclear weapons will continue to be stored in the existing facilities, um, there's the possibility that Polish F-35s could be positioned in Germany to carry nuclear weapons and participate and uh, nuclear strikes against Russia. And this is something that also could come out of this NATO this NATO summit, the, the expansion of NATO's nuclear program, because they're angry about Russia's deployment of nuclear weapons into Belarus. Uh, you know, the Poles are insisting that there has to be a face-saving mechanism that says, if you do that, we do this. And I think that that's gonna be something that is going to be um, discussed in, um, in, in, in the NATO summit. We're going to see a summit of desperate nations desperately seeking a desperate solution to a desperate problem. I think the, the word to describe what's going to be happening in Vilnius is desperate. Um, yeah, it's, uh, going to be, it's going to be a problem. Um, you know, for the last year and a half, every other month, there, it, there was a pattern here. Every time things look crappy, they'd say, we've got, you know, the M triple sevens. Oh, we're getting them. You know, there was always a new, um, it, it, it became obvious that there was a narrative. Things slumped down and we just name one of our weapons and say that's going to fix it. Things slumped down. We name one of our weapons. Well, now, you know, they're saying F-16s, they're saying this and that. But it seems to me that that whole thing is played out, that every weapon that is gone has basically, to me, I'll add this, has been discredited in a way that I can't imagine that other countries out there that buy U.S. weapons are eyeing all of these things saying, oh, yeah, I want that now. When like you put the Patriot out, you turn it on and an hour later, it's turned to rubble. Your thoughts on all of the, the situation with all of the various weapons that have been used, exposed, whatever the case may be. And now where they are and, and trying to use that game. Hey, we're sending another weapon. This is going to turn the corner. Well, I think the. Um 
the death of the leopard um, has sent a uh, shockwave across. But it, it, it should have been known beforehand. HIMARS was sold as the miracle weapon. If you recall, June of 2022, when it first employed, the, um, the, the Minister of Defense of, uh, of Ukraine was just like, the game's over. We have the HIMARS. We're firing the HIMARS. And you know, early on, they had some pretty impressive results. Why? Because the Russians hadn't um, configured themselves accordingly. When you have a system like the HIMARS, you don't want to uh, concentrate ammunition altogether in a single depot within range of the HIMARS. You don't want to have command staffs consolidated in, an, in a single position. Um, and the Ukrainians were, were getting hits. They were hitting artillery. They were hitting ammunition storage, blowing it up. They were hitting command and control, blowing it up. They were hitting troop concentrations, blowing it up. But the Russians sat there and went, HIMARS, 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 okay, we got it. They put in their air defense. Uh, they started jamming the signal. And uh, then they started dispersing. They, they said, well, you know, we're going to disperse our, our ammunition. We're only going to bring forward that which we need for here uh, for, for the moment. where Everything else is going to be on the range, scattered, uh, command and control. We're going to have jump command posts. We're going to be doing this, that, and the other thing. We're not going to concentrate troops. We're going to bring them in, you know, in, 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 in more penny packets to avoid, you know, the kind of targets that are, 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 are used. HIMARS today is not a system that has a meaningful impact on the battlefield. Um, it, it just doesn't. And I bring that up because people are like, attack them, attack them, attack them. Attack of course, is the uh, 300 mile uh, you know, range system, maybe more than 300, um, that you know the United States has been using for some time now, by the way. I just want to point that out. It's not a new system. Um, so the Russians are familiar with it. Uh, you can bring in attackums and you can launch it. Um, it's a ballistic missile. It will be shot down. It's not a magic weapon. Um, they're, they're, the Russians have the most capable air defense systems in the world, and um, the attackums will have no impact on the battlefield. Yes, when it's first used, when anything's used for the first time, it's a novelty. Uh, there will be a dramatic strike somewhere. Something will go boom. Um, Photos will be taken. Ukraine will be, you know, doing backflips, saying the war is over. And then the next time they attack and fire, it, it gets shot down. And then next thing you know, the the systems are being targeted. Yeah, you get get Lancet kamikaze drones taking it out. Um, yeah, it's over. I mean, there's no magic F-16. <laughs> I don't even know why we're talking about the F-16 because it'll get it'll have no impact on the battlefield. M1 tanks. You know, the United States promised thirty to fifty of them. I think we're sort of reconsidering that right now because lepers got slaughtered. And I think we don't want to have pictures of M1 tanks burning on the road. And that's exactly what will happen. Every M1 tank that's sent in there will be destroyed before it gets to the initial line of contact. Um, there is no magic solution. Here's the other thing, too. All these weapons are great. I mean, we use them. They're not bad. But we also have some highly trained people using them. Uh, you know, people that, you know, we've recruited, we've trained, uh, they, they have the capacity to learn, they've passed tests, they've exercised as a unit, they know how to use the equipment, they know how to maintain the equipment, um, and um, the Ukrainians don't. <laughs> we're, we're putting this technologically advanced equipment out there, and we're taking Ukrainian soldiers who just aren't up to the task. They don't have the skill set. Um, we don't give them the time to learn. I'm not saying Ukrainians are incapable of learning. That's absurd. The Ukrainians are just like anybody else. If you bring them in and you put them on task and you train them adequately, they will perform well with the equipment they're trained on. They've proven that with Soviet air equipment that they've used. Um, but it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And time is not something that Ukraine has right now. The 60,000 troops that were being uh, you know, trained from October until June of this year that are now being sacrificed on the battlefield. Um, when they're gone, there's, there's nothing left. The Ukrainians are going into general mobilization now, scraping the bottom of the barrel, and they're not going to be given a year and a half to get trained up uh, to be you know, competent. Notice I said competent. I didn't say to be really good, just competent, basic competency. It takes a year and a half. They're not going to have that. So you're going to have people who are inadequate. That's a uh, in, in the English word, it doesn't do the justification of what the, how the Russians use it, because inadequate uh, is more than just inadequate. It means you ain't any good. And uh, the Ukrainians are inadequate 
when it comes to using the equipment that we've trained them on and, um, and, 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 and having, you know, sound tactics on the battlefield. Uh, there's a, an interesting guy I follow on telegram. Um, uh, Kodakovsky, uh, Mikhail Kodakovsky is, uh, a guy who's been around since 2014, former Ukrainian, uh, uh, you know, internal uh, special forces guy who went over and uh, fought with the ethnic Russians against the Ukrainian army. Um, and uh, he's now the commander of a, a volunteer unit, uh, I think the Polstock uh, Battalion, and they're on the front lines. Uh, he, he writes about it. Um, he said that, uh, you know, two, two Ukrainian brigades that were, you know, handpicked to, you know, be trained by NATO to be in this fight have withdrawn. And um, he said that, you know, at least one of them is at 40%. That means they suffered 60% casualties. Their combat in effect, 40%. Um, you know, brigade is three to 5,000 people. Um, so if it was a 50% casualty, we're looking at between 1,500 and, um, and 2,500 casualties. It's more than that because it's 60%. So we, you know, tack on that extra 10%. Um, and that's just two brigades. There's other units that are getting eviscerated like this as well. Um, the the Ukrainians are being slaughtered on the battlefield. There's nothing that's going to happen to change this uh, outcome. Um, and then we, you you brought it up the concept, and I think we have to start, you know, asking when that's going to happen. Collapse, the collapse of the Ukrainian army. Um, and I hope that this collapse comes sooner rather than later. Not because I have some gleeful joy at uh, watching Ukrainians get beat, but uh, two things. Uh, the more reality hits home in Vilnius, the less likely it is stupid will will win out. Um, you know, I'd rather have NATO trying to figure out how to uh, adapt to the certainty of a Russian victory than NATO believing that if they change the chess game into something else, that they they have a chance of winning. Because they don't. All they have to do is have a chance of um, provoking a nuclear conflict. Uh, and, and, and that's something else that people need to reflect on. All the people that wish, you know, I think, you know, one of the best case of, uh, scenarios that's being painted by people is what they call the frozen conflict. I think there's a growing recognition that Ukraine isn't going to win this war. Ukraine isn't going to achieve a breakthrough. What they want is for Ukraine to freeze the Russians in place and then grind Russia down with relentless warfare so that over time, Russia weakens to the point that uh, it loses its will or resolve to uh, to resist. And then Ukraine might be able to win back territories. But the winning back of territories means that Russia is losing territory that constitutionally is part of Russia. That is a, an existential threat to the survival of Russia. And Russia said, we will use nuclear weapons to prevent that. So those who, who say we want a frozen war, what you're saying is you want a nuclear war with Russia. And there's people in Russia right now that are looking at that saying, yep, that's exactly what you're saying. You want a nuclear war with Russia. So if that's what you want, is it in Russia's best interest to um, wait until that happens, let the frozen war come out? Or if it appears that we're transitioning into a frozen war, why don't we preempt it? Why don't we, Russia? adopt a nuclear posture of preemption. So when it becomes clear that the United States and NATO, together with Ukraine, have embarked on a frozen war policy designed to weaken us, we preempt it by nuking them. And in the article that the gentleman wrote, uh, Sergei Karaganov, um, he, uh, he put out Poznan, Poland is the uh, target city. He said, you know, we'll, we'll pop Poland. Um, and then the question is, will the American president be willing to trade Boston for Poznan? And they brought up Boston just as a hypothetical city. But the idea is that if the United States was to respond, then it would lose an American city. And then we'd begin a general nuclear war and everybody dies. Um, and that's the direction we're heading right now. We're heading in that direction because Ukraine can't win this war. And so the next best option for NATO is the frozen war. Uh, or some sort of, you know, uh, changing the, the game. It's no longer going to be chess. It's going to be you know, checkers. Or it's going to be, uh, what's that cool game with the dice? That you move things around. Uh, 
How about sorry? That's a game that I used to play when I was a kid. I think that's pretty appropriate. Well, let me ask you one more thing. And I think this is a, I, I want to hear, um, you know, I like Andre Martianov and we, you and I have, you know, talked with him on a number of occasions. One of the things that he says about this conflict period, and that is about conflict period. Look, when we hear the high Mars are the latest one of weapon, when we hear, oh, they blew up of the Ukrainian took, you know, a hundred meters over here and, you know, two kilometers over there, right? War is not won on the tactical level. It's won, it's won on the strategic level. W explain that and how that is, um, how that dynamic is playing itself out in this conflict. Sure. I mean, you know, let's, let's, Look at something that maybe people will understand who are watching. Um, HBO had a great series, Band of Brothers, and told the story of um, you know, the 101st uh, Airborne Division, a certain uh, um, unit. And, um, you know, you, you, you see them fighting in Normandy and all that, but then they jump into, um, into the Netherlands as part of Operation Market Garden. And uh, there's, there's this one uh, episode where uh, the Germans counterattack. And, um, and the Americans have to retreat. And, uh, they, and, and retreat is never pretty. It's always ugly. And these guys are retreating. And uh, the, 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 the paratroopers are in the back of the thing saying, this sucks. Retreating sucks. It does. And if, you, if all you saw was that, you'd say, holy cow, the Americans are getting beat. The Americans are getting beat. But they're not getting beat. The Germans had a good day. The Germans were able, to, at a point in time, to gain a tactical advantage and a smart military commander, you know, confronting uh, the fact that we have lost a tactical advantage instead of suffering, um, you know, inordinate amount of casualties, will withdraw, regroup, and seek to transform the battlefield to his tactical advantage to counterattack and to push the Germans back, which is exactly what happened later on. So people need to understand right now that. Not only is there, I mean, there's a lot of fighting taking place on a very large, expansive battlefield. I don't think people truly understand the scope and scale of this conflict. You know, we, we look at little maps, but we don't realize how big that is. Anybody who's traveled in Europe and, and done the driving, you know, um, just go ahead on the map and look at the, the distance between Paris and Berlin, and then juxtapose that onto uh, a map of where the fighting is. You're like, whoa, <laughs> it's a lot of territory. This is this is this is huge. What's going on here? This is a lot of fighting. So, you know, understand that even even as competent as the Russians are, that the Ukrainians are capable of achieving a, 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 a tactical advantage at certain points on the on the map. Um, and they have they've they've counterattacked and they've taken a ridge. They've counterattacked and they've taken a tree line. They've taken a village or a house. And of course, the Ukrainians being the experts at propaganda that they are, take the selfies and they put the, 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 the film up there. But what they don't show is that, um, you know, the Russian high command saying, OK, we lost a village here. Um, all right. Bring in the uh, Fab 500s. Pop, pop. Bring in the, uh, the, 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 the TOS 1 or TOS 2 flamethrower systems. You know, let's get them with artillery. And suddenly the Ukrainians are all dead. Wounded retreating and the Russians take back up because see the Russians have the ability to withdraw, collect their forces, counterattack. When the Ukrainians take a village, they've expended everything they have. There's nothing left. The people that are left are going, man, we dodged that bullet. We're digging in. Boom. Now we all die. We're retreating again. The Ukrainians have yet to be able to exploit any tactical success. Um, and so while it, it plays well on telegram in isolation, uh, you know, it, it, it repeated over and over again in, uh, in the Western media. I mean, the British press every day, you know, if you read them, man, the Ukrainians should, should be in Moscow by now because they're one in every battle. Um, it doesn't work that way. It's, war is a is very complicated, dangerous business. Um, let's, again, reflect on, you know, Vladimir Putin when he talked about the conflict, the, the Ukrainian counteroffensive. He said that Russia was enjoying a, a 10 to 1 advantage you know, in terms of casualties. So that means that if you killed 13,000 Ukrainians, which at the time he spoke, that was the number, that means you lost 1,300 Russians. 
That's a big number, people. It's a huge number. Uh, coming up with how you lose 1,300 men in combat is mind boggling. Um, you know, there are battles that we fought in World War II where we didn't lose that many men. Uh, and yet, these are battles that are considered to be massive battles, fighting, et cetera. 1,300 dead. Um, that means that the Ukrainians are landing blows. That means there are occasions when Ukrainian tanks will roll up to a Russian trench line and kill, you know, 20 guys in the trench line because the Russians are having a bad day. The Ukrainians got the tactical advantage. Um, there'll be a time when a storm shadow missile will get through the air defense and hit a command post and take out a bunch of guys. Uh, they'll hit an ammunition dump. They'll do this. That's war. 1,300 Russians. It takes a lot to kill that many people. And that's with a 10 to 1 advantage. You know, there might be days where the Russians don't get the 10 to 1 advantage. There might be a day where the Russians are going to get the, 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 the 1 to 3 advantage, which means if you kill 10,000 Ukrainians, you're losing 3,000 guys. War is hell. And there's a lot of guys dying on both sides. It just happens that more Ukrainians are dying. But the, the notion that Russia, you know, isn't taking casualties is absurd. They're taking heavy casualties. Not as heavy as Ukrainians, but this is backbreaking what's happening to Russia. Backbreaking. It would, just, it would destroy us. Could you imagine the American people two and a half weeks into a, uh, into a military engagement uh, having, you know, 1,300 body bags show up at Dover? Come on, America, chew on that for a minute. And that's, a, that's, that's the best that's going to happen. The bad day is when you're going to have 13,000 body bags show up at Dover. Because that's, General Cavoli warned everybody about this. He said this, the scope and scale of the violence, he's the commander of uh, allied forces in Europe, four-star general, American general. And in January, he spoke to a defense forum in Sweden, said the scope and scale of the violence is beyond the imagination of NATO. That means that NATO hasn't even, can't comprehend what's happening. They're not trained for this. They're not organized for this. They're not ready for this. And um, if they ever to get into it, the, 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 the casualties would be um, prohibitive. Uh, no Western society today can sustain that kind of, that, which is why we're doing what we're doing. I mean, people need to understand. I'm, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, Garland. You know that. I try to be very well grounded. But um, George Soros, uh, who's everybody's boogeyman, uh, back in 1993, wrote an article where he talked about, you know, the future of NATO. And he said, it's imperative that if NATO is going to, you know, confront Russia, that we don't get in a situation where NATO body bags come home because that'll break the will of NATO to want to continue the fight. So what NATO needs is to find the nexus between Eastern European manpower and NATO technology to marry NATO technology up with Eastern European manpower and use this as the mechanism to inflict pain on Russia. And you don't get a better definition of what's happening today on the ground in Ukraine than marrying Eastern European manpower with NATO technology for the purpose of bringing pain to Russia. That's exactly what's happening today. It's not that he didn't say to, beat, to, to defeat Russia, to bring pain to Russia. That's all this is about. 1,300 body bags going, or they don't use body bags, going back in zinc coffins. Um, that's bringing pain to Russia. This is a sick sick way of thinking, but that's what NATO is doing. And that's what people need to cut through all this BS about we're supporting democracy. It's a, it's a dictatorship, martial law. There's no democracy there. Uh, we're supporting, you know, freedom loving. They're Nazis, you know, and we, we care for the Ukrainian people. No, you don't, because you're allowing this sick system of marrying Eastern European meat with Western steel to send Russian boys home in zinc coffins. That's what this is all about. And it's not going to work because you can't bring enough pain on Russia to beat them. Any nation that's willing to absorb or capable of absorbing 27 million dead and not forgetting about that. And these troops in the trenches, they're honest to God looking up and seeing their grandfathers or great grandfathers looking down on them. And they're like, we're not going to betray you, boss. We know what you did. We know the sacrifice you made. We're not going to betray you. you. You can't bring enough pain to that kind of people. So not only 
are we condemning the Ukrainians to destruction, or we're doing it in a in a cause we know they can't win. Any rational person knows they can't win. So we're simply sacrificing their lives. And that's that's the ultimate tragedy of this whole thing is that um, you can't even say these these Ukrainians are dying um, you know, in a worthy cause, that their sacrifice means something. Their sacrifice means absolutely nothing. Um, and shame on the West for allowing this to happen. Shame on the West for creating an environment where we can uh, rationalize the uh, the humanity of marrying East European manpower to Western with Western NATO technology. Uh, this is sick. This is criminal.